Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello and welcome to episode 240 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali, and I want to thank you for joining us today. This month, we will talk about porn. More specifically, about whether it is bad to use porn alone or with your partner. As many of you know, I have two podcasts. Other show that I have is in Farsi, and I regularly go on my colleague's show every Friday. I'm talking on the clubhouse. So I'm constantly answering people's questions about sex and sexuality. And one of the most common questions I get from the listeners wherever I'm giving a talk is about whether porn is good or bad for one's mental health and sexual functioning and our relationships. Until now, if I'm honest with you, I feel very torn on how to answer this question. Because you, if you have been our listeners, you probably know that I started my training in the field of sexual wellness as getting a tra- training on sexual addiction treatment. I did a few years ago, I think now it's more than a decade that I did a training with Alexandra Katahakis. She had a class that was wonderful on porn addiction, sex addiction, and it wasn't until several years after that that I became a sex therapist. And the view on this topic of the porn in the field of sex addiction and the field of sex therapy are very different. It cannot be more different than this. Colleagues like from each side are attacking each other. Usually my colleagues who are sex therapists, they have a specific view on porn and porn use and sexual addiction colleagues also have the, their own way of looking at it. Although this is a personal question, but also I think it's important to see what science say about porn use. That's why I decided to dedicate the entire month of August talking about porn with my fellow researchers that I know, clinicians, psychologists, to see what science tells us about this issue. I learned a lot from talking about it with experts, and my hope is that you will listen to these conversation with an open mind. In this week's episode, my guests are two researchers who published very interesting articles on this topic. Our guests are Katrina Litsu and Alan McKee. Katrina is a senior research assistant and doctoral researcher at the University of Southampton. She has a Bachelor of Psychology and Master of Sexology. Her current research focuses on female sexuality and the use of pornography. The second guest is Alan McKee. Alan is a professor in digital and social media in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at UTS. He's an expert on entertainment and healthy sexual development. He has published on healthy sexual development and entertainment education for healthy sexuality in journals, including the New Media and Society, Archives of Sexual Behavior, the International Journal of Sexual Health, the Journal of Research, and Sex Education. Here's my conversation with Katrin Litsu and Alan Mackey. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am honored and excited to have two wonderful guests today. As I mentioned during introduction, I love their article and their research. They're here to share their experiences and their findings with us. So I would like to welcome Katerina Litsu and Alan Mickey. Alan and Katerina, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, thank you. I'm very excited to be part of your show. I am thrilled to have you guys as well. You know, I was just sharing with you that I found this study very interesting because that's that's the question that's always been in my mind. As a clinician and a psychologist, I know that people have different view of what porn is, but I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing. Even with the clients, we don't have a shared language. So share with our listeners, how did you get interested to do this study? Shall I go first, Katerina? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So again, 
And thank you very much for having us on this morning, Dr. Mwali. It's an absolute pleasure. The article that we're talking about has just been published in, in the journal Porn Studies, and it's about the relationship between the consumption of pornography and sexual pleasure. So what we were doing was looking at the history of academic research, trying to find out, do people who consume more pornography have more sexual pleasure? Do they have more pleasurable sex lives or, or less pleasurable sex lives, or, or is there no correlation? So we were looking at that question, particularly across academic disciplines. So here's the thing. When you talk about academics researching pornography, that's not just all the same thing. Some people come from psychology. Some people come from other academic disciplines like history or, or politics or, or women's studies. And the reason this project started was that I designed it with another team member, uh, Professor Roger Ingham, a few years ago. And my background is actually in film studies. That's, that's how, how I started as a researcher. And in film studies and, and cultural studies, there's a lot of different kinds of research about pornography that, that tells you all kinds of different stories. And, and for example, there's a whole tradition of research on the way that women have used pornography to develop sexual agency and to overcome some of the stereotypes in our culture that women are passive and don't have much sexual interest. And particularly during 1970s feminism, women's sexual pleasure became a big political issue and um, uh, teaching women uh, workshops on understanding their bodies and uh, embracing their genitalia and having orgasms was a big part of the political project. And so there's this whole tradition in my academic discipline of looking at porn as a feminist political act. Now, I then started coming across academics from other areas doing research on porn, like social psychology, who are very different stories. And the stories that they were telling was that pornography is harmful and it's damaging and it leads to risky behaviors and at least to negative attitudes towards women. And I was really confused about how one group of academic researchers doing very rigorous, respectable academic research that was being published in the right journals were finding that pornography was part of women's political emancipation. And another group of academic researchers, again, very rigorous and very reputable and published in the proper journals, were finding out that pornography was damaging towards attitudes towards women. And I was, I was wondering, how can that be? How can it be that uh, two groups of, of well-intentioned well-trained academics are coming up with completely different answers to similar questions. So we decided to put together this project to do a review of not just the research in one area, but all the different kinds of academic research on pornography, looking at different aspects of pornography consumption and healthy sexual development. And the article that we're talking about today, as I said, was specifically about pleasure because one of the key aspects of healthy sexual development is that you learn to accept that sex can be pleasurable. Uh, because if you have grown up being told that sex is dirty and wrong and you should feel guilty about it, that is not healthy sexual development. Um, despite what the Catholic Church might try to tell you. So we were interested there in, in this project, specifically about finding out what different kinds of academics were saying about this question. And then um, the results, I think, were quite surprising. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's how I got involved. What about you, Katarina? So I am a psychologist and I have a background in sexology also. So I'm very much interested in sexual health and sexuality, all, all aspects of sexuality, really. And we know that almost everybody watches uh, pornography and especially teenagers. And we know that they do not get adequate uh, sex education in school. Uh, that is why I became interested in, in this uh, project. I'm coming in this project, uh, not, I'm not against or pro pornography. I'm just trying to see what is happening and see if we can educate young people to realize uh, what they're watching and uh, have a clear idea of what pornography is. Also, I'm very much interested in uh, women's sexuality, and it is uh, women usually are depicted in a negative way in sexual in uh, pornography. So I was I, I wanted to get into that and see what is going on. So yeah, so this is how I joined the project, and we came up with uh, this article that Alan just mentioned. A secondary aspect of the project was putting together a team of researchers from very different disciplines to try and work out how we can talk to each other, because commonly academics work in teams of similar kind of people, whereas we put together this, this team from very different backgrounds. So Katerina and I are from very different backgrounds. Like I say, I'm from the kind of most wishy-washy, 
touchy-feely humanities side of academic research, whereas Katerina is a very rigorous um, social scientist, uh, properly trained in, in research methods. So that was fascinating, um, working in a team with different people, because we had so much fun just trying to even talk to each other, because there were so many moments when I would say something and Katerina would just look at me like I was mad and vice versa, like kind of how do we define data? Can we just change our research question in the middle of the project because we feel like it? And we all had different answers to these questions. So that was the, the other, other aspect, was getting to work with people who spoke different languages. And that was so much fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. And also, I, I, even though I'm not uh, talking on behalf of all psychologists, we psychologists usually like to have a specific definition of the thing we are about to research. So I wasn't actually aware that in other disciplines they do not do that. So it was really, really fun finding that during the process and exploring ways of how to work together and resolve our differences. Fascinating. I'm glad that you guys were able to find a shared language and, <laughs> and you did this research together. And you know what's interesting in thinking about more kind of from the psychology discipline, exactly what Alan was saying that was that's accurate because at times people think about whenever the conversation of porn comes, people immediately want to kind of talk about porn addiction, how horrible it is, more on a global way versus kind of like thinking about more on an individualistic point. So it seems like you guys talked to kind of had collected data about a number of different disciplines and their, their approach toward this. So tell us more about what was some of those interdisciplinary findings that you got? Well, one of the, one of the things that struck me was that in the humanities, where I come from, there's a lot more encouragement for everybody to be original. So what I mean by that is that in social psychology, I was amazed that social psychologists are still asking the same questions about pornography that they were in the 1970s. So you can trace back the history of social psychology research on pornography to actually is to the, um, the President's Commission on Pornography in 1970, which was the first time that there'd been significant social psychological research on pornography done in America. And that research asked the questions about does pornography lead to violence against women? Does it, does it lead to um, aggression? Does it destroy relationships? And those questions, in very similar terms, are the same questions that social psychologists are still asking 50 years later. Because in social psychology, it has a commitment to what I might call a, a scientific paradigm, where you always build on the previous work. So every 500 years or so, there's a massive shift in scientific paradigms. But within those 500 years, you keep on doing the same thing over and over again, just trying to polish it a little bit. Whereas in the humanities, it's up for grabs. Every time a, a, a film studies professor or a literature professor sits down, they're trying to think with a blank sheet of paper of something completely original to say about this object of study. And so that leads to very different ways of thinking because in the social sciences, if you just want to take a completely different approach to pornography, you have to, well, you're not really allowed to do that to start with because the referees for the academic journals will always come back and say, but what about the 50 years of work on whether pornography causes violence against women? You can't say, well, I'm not interested in that. I want to ask a different <laughs> question because that is the question that we ask. And so that was that was one one thing that, that really struck me about the differences between the disciplines. Katerina? I have I have to, to mention another article that uh, we wrote in the project. It's because it's about the uh, definitions of pornography, actually. And because w when we started to work together, it was actually four of us, two from um, the psychology area and two from media studies. So we we realized that we don't um, speak the same language and we don't actually communicate very well when it comes to research. So we had different ide ideas about what pornography is and how it is defined. So we actually looked into that, into how the different disciplines define a pornography. And we, because we we thought that we f what we found was very interesting, we wrote another paper about definitions. <laughs> so basically in our, in that paper, we, we're saying that there are two definitions and that usually uh, different disciplines uh, use uh, either one or the other. There are, there were instances that uh, people from some disciplines uh, prefer both of the definitions, but this is an example again that uh, how different disciplines 
uh, speak different languages when it comes to research and when it comes to pornography, actually, because I think I, I even I have I belong in the pornography research uh, uh, area for a few years now. But I think that uh, what pornography actually is, it's coming in, into conceptualization, if I can say that now, because of uh, research that is happening in other places of the world also. I love that, Katerina, you mentioned that. And I, I remember when I was reading that article that it was very also very powerful about the definition. I was also kind of like thinking about what what pornography is, and I know in that there are like different definitions. And some people think about if you are kind of masturbating to this content, then it's pornography. But people masturbate to the Sears catalog, <laughs> so it could be, and that's that's not necessarily pornography. So, how did you guys define pornography for this particular? Reason? Research. You're absolutely right about the the different ways in which people think about pornography, and there has actually been some research done on that, where, where the researchers gave people a list of twenty different kinds of cultures that is this pornography or not, and found out that it, it's very different. For some people, Hollywood movies with sex scenes. Some people, sex education textbooks with they call that pornography. So it it, it very much differs from from culture to culture. Just going back to the question about the differences between the disciplines, really important for your podcast, found one of the main reasons that social psychologists and media studies people disagree about pornography is because we disagree about what is healthy sexuality. And that was something that really came through with us. So one of the findings of the article we're talking about that I think is particularly interesting for this podcast is the difference between one of the reasons why social psychological work on pornography disagrees with media studies work on pornography is because we disagree on our definition of what counts as healthy sexuality. And so one of the things that surprised me, and I'll let Katerina talk for herself, but one of the things that surprised me about our findings was that in the past 50 years, there has been so little work done on the question of whether or not consuming pornography gives you more sexual pleasure. That actually hasn't been much of a focus for the research. What there's been an awful lot of research on is whether or not using pornography is correlated with a stable monogamous binary relationship. And that's interesting because I started to realize that for social psychologists, being in a stable monogamous binary relationship for them was the most important thing. Whereas in my disciplines, in cultural studies and, and media studies, that's almost irrelevant. And certainly for a lot of feminist writing, that's a bad thing because marriage is the ultimate patriarchal institution that oppresses women. And so in, in my disciplines, kind of the, the classic example is in cultural studies, Michel Foucault argues that fisting is a transgressive act that challenges the patriarchal political systems. So we're all about being transgressive and breaking things down and being queer and challenging dominant patriarchal models of marriage. Whereas the social psychological work seem to be celebrating people staying in a relationship. And in my reading of, of a lot of the social psychological research, it was pornography is bad because it gives people ideas. And if we just get rid of porn, people will stay in shitty, awful relationships with shitty, awful sex because they won't know any better. And that would be good. But um, that's just my reading of the literature. Katerina, what's your thoughts on that? Well, even though I do not speak again on behalf of uh, all psychologists, I, I I agree that there is a lot of research done comes uh, or with uh, when it comes to pornography use and monogamous relationships, and also a lot of uh, research done when it comes to risks and even addiction. Even though addiction is not something that is officially defined, I mean porn addiction. So, so it seems like a lot of research in the past, a lot of pornography research has been focusing on these issues and had kind of a negative aspect of pornography. But uh, I, I get the impression now that things are kind of uh, slowly changing in uh, the psychology, sexual health uh, uh, research area, and that people are trying to focus on other things like how porn, for example, can uh, impact uh, positively people's lives. And, uh, and uh, uh, what Alan said about um, sexual pleasure and pornography use, this is something that actually hasn't been researched yet, but it's something very interesting to, to, to look into uh, in the future. And I suspect that the reason that particularly social psychology hasn't had much time for research on pornography and pleasure is because it would the research is going to show that people who use pornography get a lot of sexual pleasure. 
because they, they are masturbating and having a lot of fun. And for the social psychologists, for whom the most important thing is staying in a long-term monogamous binary relationship, that is partly it is irrelevant because sexual pleasure doesn't matter. What matters is, is your marriage stable? But also it's kind of dangerous because if we, if we actually acknowledge that porn gives people pleasure, then that's going to make it sound even more attractive. We actually found one article in our, uh, our survey that was arguing that masturbation is bad because it encourages people to be selfish sexually when they should be focusing on their partner. And that is kind of, that doesn't match up with any definition of, of healthy sexual development that, that I've ever come across. Katerina? Well, there is actually uh, that article, but I have to disagree with you, Alan. I don't think that psychologists are afraid that uh, they're going to find that pornography enhances pleasure. I think I would be very, very excited to see that uh, pornography use is actually enhancing people's uh, sexual lives in a positive way. Who, who knows? Uh, we'll see what uh, future research brings. The approach that we have been challenging, Nazanin, is what we would call a normative approach. And that's what I think we see mostly in the research on pornography, is it believes there's only one way to have a happy, healthy sex life. And um, this is uh, binary, monogamous, loving, not casual, so it's long term, not paid for, between people of similar ages having sex primarily for a reason other than pleasure. So that is to deepen your relationship or to express how much you love somebody or to have children. And that's a normative approach. And my argument certainly is that none of that is relevant to healthy sexual development. You can have a very healthy sex life, which is has fuck buddies and friends and polyamory and kinky BDSM um, and group sex. All of those things can be part of a healthy sex life so long as they're consensual, informed, safe, and that you are comfortable with your, your body and your identity. Those are the elements that make for a healthy sex life, not whether or not there's any spanking. But in a lot of the research on pornography, if there's spanking, then that's bad because we have to encourage people to have sex without any spanking or hair pulling or any kind of rough sex. And it should be gentle and loving and mainly involve looking in people's eyes and telling them how beautiful they are. So I would call that a, a normative approach. Katerina? Um, I think that there is definitely uh, this aspect that uh, Alan talks about, but I, I have the impression that this kind of uh, is, is changing now at the end, it kind of belongs in the past. And I, I have uh, a very positive aspect uh, and a, a, a very positive expectation that uh, um, foreign researchers uh, from the social sciences and from psychology are going to start looking into these uh, uh, issues. And also, as a way to, to defend them, I have to say that sometimes the way research is done, it's, uh, it doesn't allow us to do certain things when it comes to you know statistics and analyzing data and stuff like that. So maybe this is uh, one of the reasons that uh, people haven't actually looked into these issues yet. But uh, I'm positive that in the future, uh, the, the area is going to expand because we know that there is not, although research is happening on the on the area of pornography, there is not, it's not such a wide um, uh, field yet. Uh, it is getting bigger. And I think eventually it will cover all the issues that make uh, Alan disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good that we will have get, hopefully we're moving toward that direction of having a bigger kind of like field when it comes to research in the field of pornography, as, as you both can agree that I would imagine that with human sexuality overall, it's very underfunded and it's not that many institutions that they study that, at least in the discipline of psychology that I know. So I think any kind of a research or kind of like development of new research, I think it's very, very exciting, especially around porn i feel there are it's a multi-layer issues when it comes to negativity around porn that people kind of like develop of course we have kind of like more religious conservative family-based approach but also there is this next layer of uh, kind of sex addiction porn addiction that that also play a role into people kind of like the negative viewing of porn but i agree with you there's a galaxy of options out there we, i don't think we can kind of decide that this kind of 
of like all of these options are bad and these are all against humanity and morality and all of that. So I think it's wonderful that you guys did this research. So what did you find as far as the correlation between pleasure and pornography? Well, I we didn't find much to be honest because I mean, we we did write a paper about it, but we found that uh, when it, when it comes to pornography, the the word pleasure is not mentioned that much, and people haven't looked into that. So I don't have a straight answer to give you about whether people who watch pornography get more sexual pleasure. Also, again, there is the issue with definitions. So many different words are used, like satisfaction and pleasure. So it, it, again, you someone has to be very tedious and try to look into these uh, issues uh, a lot. So we we have this uh, first initial uh, idea that for specific people watching pornography gives them, allow them to explore them, their, their sexual uh, selves more. Again, more research is needed on the area. One thing that interested me, Katerina, from, from the data that, that you generated was that there, we, we found a few projects that had been done with women and gay men, and it was mainly people from the humanities. So it wasn't quantitative social science. It was mainly qualitative work where they sat down and spoke to gay men or women about their porn use. And it gave us an interesting, complex picture where they were certainly reporting pleasure and also some kind of identity work for the gay men, for example. So pornography was helping them work out what it meant to be gay. And also um, interesting, another wrinkle was the women saying that, yes, they enjoyed pornography, but they were conflicted about it, either because what was upset them or because they knew, because of the way the culture talks about pornography, that they shouldn't be enjoying it. So there was a guilt thing. So you have some of that humanities insights and like all humanities research it is small scale cannot be generalized and is very and full of caveats yes this but also that whereas the joy of quantitative social sciences is you get simple answers with large numbers that can be generalized so we have some data from the humanities side of things, which says it's a complicated, messy picture, but definitely pleasure is in there, which is not surprising. It's like common sense. Of course, people get pleasure from porn. That is the reason that people mostly look at pornography. And I was going to say something else that I've completely can, forgotten. Can I say something? <laughs> can I please say something else? Um, so when it comes to pornography use and pleasure, we found that uh, this pleasure has been researched when it comes to women and gay men. Uh, but when it comes to straight men, uh, usually something, uh, the research is around some type of risk or addiction. I mean, something negative. So uh, there is not much research done on straight men using pornography uh, for pleasure. So it's only uh, the negative stuff that uh, previous research, research has looked into. And that, I think, is really interesting that gay men and women, their sexual pleasure is acceptable for study and is interesting, but straight men, the idea that you would say, start a project, how can we help straight men have more sexual pleasure, clearly is almost unthinkable because straight male sexuality now, in, in certainly in, in pornography research and maybe wider in our culture, is seen as a bad thing. It's, it, is, it is the risk that is going to damage women. So a lot of the research seems to be about how do we manage male sexuality? It's a very, I would call it a traditional gender view that sees women as passive and in need of protection sexually and men as the source of sexual power who somehow have to be managed and strapped in. It's like kind of social psychology thinks about men's sexuality in the same way as um, fathers of teenage girls threatening their dates with a gun as they go off to the prom. I love that. I have a, a question for Katerina. I know you looked into women's sexual wellness. And one, one thing that Alan mentioned that kind of reminded me of like hundreds of times the, the statement I heard, regardless from lots of women, I have a Farsi show too, and I get that question a lot. So women talk about how their desire, the porn that they're watching is not politically correct. What do you think about that? I... Well, I'm currently doing research uh, to with women when it comes to their pornography use and uh, not being co politically correct. It's not a term that any of my participants have used, but um, they sometimes they kind of feel um, conflicted because 
because some participants have said to me that they 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 like to watch a specific type of pornography, let's say something that is kinky or BDSM, but uh, they are confused because they don't actually like that in uh, in uh, uh, their private lives. So this is an issue that is been coming up with my participants. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yes, yes, that's exactly what is when I ask a follow-up question people talk about like oh I have like I'm masochistic and there's like I, I love pain power exchange in the bedroom how can I treat it or perhaps this is something that I the porn that I watch what's wrong with me kind of I watch rape fantasy porns and what's wrong with me and they get very distraught around that uh, and, and and we know the fantasies and reality are different and there's just like such a multi-layer kind of a part to it when it comes to our erotic template so I was kind of curious if you've done any have you heard it there was was that part of your research yeah I have heard people saying that women saying that and what I usually say to them also I, I, I'm coming back to the issue about sexual education is because people have not been educated to view pornography as a fantasy as something that they enjoy doing for fun uh, it's not how actually uh, life sex happens with uh, partners unless it, it's I mean it's up to anybody to do whatever they like uh, in uh, in bedroom so there is nothing wrong yeah. people like to watch uh, extreme stuff uh, in uh, pornography and then uh, they like something else in their private life so yeah pornography is just a fantasy yeah and there's also there's also a wider question that's really interesting we know that large numbers of women are very interested in and aroused by kinky BDSM sex. And we know that both from academic research, but also from cultural phenomena like Fifty Shades. This is not surprising. And in fact, uh, sometimes, uh, from some perspectives, it seems like BDM is, is, BDSM is actually quite a feminized sexual preference. And that is up against the absolute opposite argument, which we hear all the time in, in journalism research, that BDSM is somehow violence against women or disrespectful against women. So you have this sexual preference that a lot of women have, which they're being told regularly is bad and oppressive and leading to violence against women. So that sets you up in a very difficult situation. And there's been some research done that points out that in a patriarchal culture, women, women's role is to be passive and is to be taken by men. That is what patriarchy, that's what conservative gender roles set up. And I've become fascinated recently by watching rom-coms, romantic comedy movies, and they still set up this storyline that happens all the time where the man chases the woman and the woman says no, because in a rom-com, the first time they meet, she always hates him because he's annoying or silly or stupid. So the woman says no, but the man doesn't take no for an answer. And he keeps on chasing her and she says no, and he keeps on chasing. And eventually he grabs her and pushes her back and kisses her. And sometimes it's against her will. But as soon as they kiss, then she gets into it. And she's like, oh, I do love him after all. And so the absolute mainstream depiction of heterosexual romance is that women are passive and chaste and men don't take no for an answer and they force the woman and eventually the woman realizes that she loves it. So the absolute mainstream, this isn't pornography. This is the, the fairy tale story that young girls are told is a BDSM story where they are powerful, powerless and helpless and passive and say no, but the man forces them and then they love it. So the very heart of traditional conservative female heterosexuality is about power games and powerlessness. So it's not surprising that women are growing up in this culture with those kind of stories in their heads. And I have to say that a lot of my participants have mentioned that, that to me, that they kind of feel pressured from society and that it is not okay for them to talk about uh, watching pornography or mentioning that they like specific things because they say that they have been because they have been raised in patriarchy and they kind of they have been condi conditioned to think that uh, they should be kind of uh, you know um, sensitive and innocent and uh, e even though this is okay for some people uh, it is uh, also okay to not be like that it, it again it depends on the person absolutely and you know it was such an interesting different lens I never thought about that I love rom-coms but how it almost kind of like shows that idol this non-consensual kind of touch and behavior and I was like oh god I don't know 
<laughs> if that's that's okay in a way. I know that it's fantasy, it's different, but that's that's an interesting view of that. I guess the other last question I had was around, I don't know if you guys, what do you think about that? Is it amateur porn? There is this surge of amateur porn in various sites. Of course, there's a question about consent, but do we know, do, is there any research that you guys heard about or uh, you, you know of that talks about that and research that? There is research about pornography use and consent, but off the top of my head, I cannot, I do not remember right now anything about that. But the thing is that when it comes to amateur porn, sometimes it's uh, not clear, uh, you know, the, the, the lines are kind of blurry when it comes to amateur and consent. I mean, there is amateur porn that you can clearly see that the people know that they are being recorded by a camera because they, they look into the camera or say hi or something like that. But also there are a lot of videos with people just having sex in their homes and it's not clear if if uh, they have consented or not. So there are legal matters there also. I would say that all amateur pornography by definition is consensual because if it isn't, that's not pornography. That's image-based sexual harassment. That is a crime and that's yeah. a very different thing. So amateur pornography, again, there's a whole range of different kinds of amateur pornography. And this has a long history as well, which is interesting. I'm not sure about the American market, but in Britain and Australia, the the down market porn magazines used to have sections called Reader's Wives or Reader's Husbands. And people would send in photographs of their own partners naked. And that was a, a venerable tradition. It's kind of it's, it's a form of exhibitionism. And the internet has really allowed that to take off now. And there's a whole range now of different kinds of amateur pornography, which ranges from yeah, suburban couples. Uh, in their front lounge room where half the fascination is looking at the decoration in the lounge room and, and wondering how they would choose wallpaper like that. But then there's also really interesting projects like Make Love Not Porn, which is a website which uh, uploads only homemade amateur pornography, but with a very specific political purpose, which is to show consensual loving sex between people who are actually in relationships. So the whole range of different things that falls under that, the, the, the title of amateur pornography. And I know a specific site that it's actually that. It's uh, amateur couples or some couples, uh, more people, I mean, that they're having amateur, they're having sex in their homes and they record it and they upload it to, the, to that specific website that it is specifically about that. So this is a, a safe way for people to watch amateur porn if they are worried about consent issues. Wonderful. I think they can have a multiple benefits if, if it's been done consensually, because I think it helps people to see diversity of real bodies, real genitals. It's not like everything, not necessarily that particular image that we see in commercial porn. We get to see like how, because you're right that unfortunately people think sex is, uh, porn is sex education. That that's one of the kind of like negative thing I hear about porn that it's not realistic, it's not real, but it's not meant to be real the same way that other kind of movies are not meant to be real most of the time. But I think for people that are kind of interested in more realistic view of how sex is, and that can give them diversity of sexual behaviors, different kind of things, depending on what they're watching. I can talk to you guys for hours about this thing. <laughs> But I know we're toward the end of our time. Is there any last thought that you guys want to share with our listeners? Um, not, not really. Just I want to say thank you again for having me. No, of course. It's my pleasure. I want, I'm, I, I want my clients and my listeners, everyone know about your work and, and Alan's work. So if they want to read your articles, they want to learn more about your, your research and yourself, what are some of the places that they can find you? Well, they have to... Well, Google our names, actually, and the academic papers that we have written uh, will come up. And if you want to get onto Twitter, you can follow me um, at Prof. Alan McKee, all one word. And if you have a look through there, you can see everything I'm tweeting about. I tweet about sex and entertainment and entertainment education and articles and kinky sex and follow me on twitter yes yes uh, I, I leave it on the show notes katarina go ahead and uh, yeah my twitter handle is uh, at 
K-L-E-C-H-O-U. So if anyone wants to uh, follow me, yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I I'll... tweet about sexual stuff uh, and sex research. Well, who doesn't want more of that? <laughs> <laughs> so myself and all of my listeners, uh, I'm sure we will follow you guys <laughs> and looking forward to the content that you're putting, putting and sharing. I leave a link to, to one of the websites that has the article. So if someone want to read the abstract, they're welcome to find it in the show notes. Again, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Thank you for doing this work. I think it's very meaningful and useful to many people and hopefully we'll have you back in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. I definitely learned a lot myself and it gave me a different perspective on, on this topic of porn. On a different note, this is my birthday month and I have a very special gift for you. I decided to share a resource with you that I have shared so far only with my own private clients. Many people often find themselves stuck when it comes to increasing, augmenting their sexual imagination. And it's hard for people, especially in long-term relationship, to create psychological arousal. I have created a worksheet, it's a checklist actually, of various resources that can help you to expand your imagination. In the list, you will find the number of suggestions for erotic literature, audio that you can listen to, and visual content that you can check out that will help you to access your erotic self. I'm not affiliated with any of these websites. These are the resources that I created after hearing from my clients about what they found useful, my colleagues, and my personal uh, use of some of these material. And it's completely up to you if you want to use them or not. However, from everything I shared with my clients so far, this is their number one favorite worksheet and checklist. The link is in the show notes. And as I mentioned to you, it's completely free. It's my gift to you. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you're subscribing to our show so you will continue to listen to our conversation on whether porn is good or bad or neutral for your mental health. I'll talk to you next Tuesday. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexology.com sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.